My name is Caitlin. I'm an animal care specialist here at the San Antonio Zoo, and today I'm going to take you on a tour through our grottos. Now, this area is one of those spots in the zoo that's a little bit out of the way, so a lot of times people may miss it. Uh, instead, they may hit our awesome reptile house, which is right across the pathway there. But today we're going to go through these grottos areas that used to be known as our cat grottos. But kind of a funny fact is we actually only have three cats actually living in the cat grottos, and the rest of these are some awesome, really cool, cool animals. So let's go check them out. Now, while we're back here, guys, if you have any questions, go ahead and tip tap those into our comments section. But first up, we have our ringtail cats. These guys are native right here in North America, native to Texas. They're really fun animals, and we have two of them in there. Their names are Piper and Gus. Um, both of these guys were wild caught, and before they came to live here at the San Antonio Zoo, they're wonderful little guys. Um, really cool thing about ringtail cats is they're actually not cats at all. Uh, they are more closely related to raccoons. Now, their scientific name is Basaricus astutus. I'm try saying that time five times fast, but that's actually derived from the Greek word referring to foxes. Um, no, they're not foxes either. These guys are more closely related to raccoons, like I said, and they've got that bright stripy tail that reminds us that they're related to those awesome uh, masked critters that live also here in the United States. Now, ringtail cats are omnivores. These guys are found all over the Uni uh, western United States, down here in Texas. They are predators, so they eat things like small rodents, small reptiles, sometimes even amphibians, eggs if they can get a hold of them. Um, they'll also eat things like insects or even fruits and vegetables as well. Now, they're excellent climbers. They're really cool because uh, they can climb and do all sorts of uh, almost parkour-like uh, climbing. So really fun to watch these guys hang out in their habitat. They can climb up straight rock walls, up all of these branches, and they've got some fun hides. Uh, they've got that beautiful little log down on the ground and that fun little tree house that we've built for them specifically. Um, really, really cool little habitat here. So these two that you see in there, we've got Piper on the left. She is our female. And then Gus is kind of hiding right back there in the back right corner. <laughs> they are adorable faces, aren't they? They're very, very fun. How big can they um, can they get? These guys are fully grown, so you can see the two of them. They're not very big at all. Um, they're a little bit smaller than your typical house cat, but they can grow to be maybe around 9 to 10 pounds total fully grown. Uh, not very big at all. Now, they are very shy. Uh, they're not easily found out in their natural habitat, even though they're pretty prolific across the western United States. Um, typically, they are more active at night. They hide during the day. They typically will nest in uh, tree hollows throughout the day and then come out at night to find food. Um, right now, it looks like Piper's exploring around a little bit. We've got some fun enrichment in that house for them that their keeper, Tori, put in there just a few minutes ago. Let's see if you have any other questions, guys. What is their temperament? Like I said, very shy. Um, they're very timid animals, so they do defend their territory against other ringtail cats. Um, they're not typically social. They will live together as mated pairs or singly. Uh, usually a male and a female will have overlapping ranges, and sometimes they will share a nest. Um, other than that, during breeding season is really the only time you'll see them really come together. Um, breeding season is in the spring as well as birthing season, so um, females can have litters of up to about six individual babies, and they stay with mom for uh, a few months while they're weaned and they're still nursing, and then once they're weaned, they can go off on their own. Any other questions, guys? Not, well, if you don't have any other questions, we're going to move on to our next awesome cat in the grottos. So over here is where we have my favorite Grotto's cat. His name is Dusky, and here he is. So Dusky is what we call a fishing cat. Super, super cool animal. These guys are found um, in Indonesia. So they've got a pretty small range over there in Eastern, um, I'm sorry, Western Asia. They typically like to live in tropical rainforested areas. 
And like their name suggests, they primarily eat fish. So they are found in areas where there's lots of wetlands and waterways and rivers and streams because their primary food source is going to be all sorts of different types of fish. Here at the zoo, Dusky gets a variety of fish. He eats herring, salmon, capelin, and some smelt. Um, he also gets shrimp every once in a while, as well as some different types of chunked red meat. So that's his big diet here at the zoo. Hi, Dusky. He's checking you guys out and seeing what's going on. Also, it looks like uh, his keeper, Tori, put out a nice ju meat juice popsicle, or a blood sickle, as we like to call it. Um, as enrichment, so we'll see if he goes back over to that here in just a moment. Now, typically when we think of cats, we don't typically think of those animals spending a lot of time in water, right? But fishing cats actually are very good swimmers. We'll even throw his fish, uh, part of his diet, into his pool that he has on exhibit, and he will go in and go swimming for it. So sometimes these cats will even go swimming just for fun. They're also pretty good climbers. You guys can see that he's got kind of a stocky body for a cat. Um, they're good climbers, really good fishers, but they spend most of their time on the forest floor. So that's where most of their prey is going to be. They'll also go for small amphibians, things like that. Now he's got that beautiful dappled coat with got his stripes and some of his spots on there. Those are for camouflage. That's kind of how they hide from any of their larger predators that might be in their area. But typically, fishing cats don't have any natural predators. Now, that's not to say they are not threatened. These guys are listed um, under the IUCN red list as vulnerable. Um, <laughs> he's sitting there like, I don't know if I want to get wet today. Um, but you guys that's, can see that's an excellent example of how they scoop fish out of streams and ponds. They'll actually just go in, scoop them out of the water, if they're in a deeper area, I have even seen Dusky go like head first into his pool, go all the way submerged, and grab things with his mouth, which is really, really fun to see. So they're excellent swimmers. Um, I was mentioning that they're listed as vulnerable on the IUCN red list, and that means that they're not endangered, but they could become endangered. Now, typically this species is threatened um, by humans more than anything else, and because uh, of habitat loss is the biggest reason that they remain vulnerable out in their natural habitat. Sheila would like to know how much he weighs. That's a great question, Sheila. This species uh, typically weighs up to around 25-ish pounds, maybe 30 pounds. Dusky is on the heavier end of that. He weighs between 28 and 30 pounds right now. Great question. He's got some fun adaptations for swimming uh, because they do spend so much time in and around the water. Fishing cats have webbed toes, which is kind of fun. It acts like little fins when he's swimming in the water, helps him get around a little bit better. Uh, he also has a two-layer coat, so he's got a very dense, thick uh, under fur, and that kind of helps him keep warm and dry when he goes swimming in the water. And then his outer coat, which we call guard hairs, are going to be the part that has actual patterning on it, and again, that is for camouflage for him. So it helps him to hide from some of those bigger predators out there. Are there any other questions about Dusky as he's munch, munch, munching away? What, uh, can you just repeat what kind of cat this is? This is a fishing cat. So like I said, not a lot of people think of cats and water going well together, but this particular species, fishing cats, are known for their swimming abilities and how much time they actually spend in water in their natural environment. Do you know how old Dusky is and how long fishing cats can live? Oh, that's a good question. Off the top of my head, I don't remember how old Dusky is. We take care of a lot of animals at the zoo, and sometimes it can be hard to remember who has which birthday. But I can tell you guys that under human care, their average life expectancy is into their late teens. Um, it's unknown in their natural environment. They're very shy animals, and they can be very hard to find out in their natural, exi uh, natural, exi natural environment. Um, so it can be hard to know exactly what their average life span is. And can you tell us what he's been munching on today? <laughs> today he got some herring, and looks like right now he's licking on a yummy blood sickle, which is a form of enrichment that we'll give these guys on some of our hotter days. 
and it's one of our warmer days that we've had so far this spring, so we decided to break out our popsicles and see how these guys like some of these frozen treats. It looks like Dusky likes it pretty well. <laughs> He's super cute. Dusky's one of my favorite animals here in the grottos. He's lots of fun to work with. Out in their natural environment, they're found in Indonesia, so Sri Lanka, Bangladesh, and Vietnam, that kind of area. Uh, typically, their natural environment includes um, tropical rainforests or wetlands, but they have been known to be found uh, up in drier forests as well. He is digging that ice pop, so we're going to let him enjoy that and move on to our next critter, which are some pretty cool, pretty small little guys. Alrighty, so we're going to move down this way, and I'm going to try really hard not to fall over as I walk backwards. But we take care of a lot of really cool animals here in the grottos, and some of the unexpected ones that I never thought I would really enjoy working with are actually some of the most fun. So right here around this corner, we have a really neat species. These are called northern tree shrews, and it looks like he has access to his inside holding right now, which is fine. Um, but he may pop out here in just a minute and check out some of this enrichment that Tori just gave him. Uh, northern tree shrews are really cool species. They are found um, in Asia as well. There he goes, starting to run around a little bit. <laughs> Check him out. So he's going to zoom around just a little bit, but they're native to southeastern Asia and typically found in rainforested areas. Um, because they have the name tree shrew, you might think that they are arboreal or more prone to be found in trees, but they actually spend a lot of time near the ground level of the forest. Uh, these guys are mostly insectivores. They primarily eat insects, and here at the zoo they get a diet that consists, consists of an insectivore jowl, chow, and um, also some worms, some other bugs, as well as fruits and veggies as well. Out in their natural environment, it's really cool that they have a symbiotic relationship with the pitcher plant, which is a really big, uh, almost bowl-like flower um, that attracts bugs. And the shrews will come down and lick the nectar out of the bottom of the bowl, and then they'll turn around and they'll poop inside the pitcher plant. And the pitcher plant will actually digest that for their, its own nutrients, which is a pretty neat relationship, I think. Um, so they have that for nectar. They can use that for energy. Looks like right now he's got a little foraging toy. He's got some bugs hidden in all that substrate uh, over there on the cardboard. And he's just going to climb around looking for food and see what else is going on. Kind of another fun thing about these shrews is they've got a very short breeding season. Uh, and once they do breed, the mom will actually hide her babies away in a separate nest. So the parents will hang out in one nest and the babies will spend time in a completely different nest to hopefully keep predators away from those babies uh, and the mom will only visit once every two days or so and let them nurse for about five minutes. After that they're on their own. It's pretty crazy. Any questions about our cute little shrews guys? If not, that's totally fine. Let's move on and see our next critter. Now this one's one of my other very favorite animals to talk about. She's lots of fun. She's a big hit with guests when they come visit here at the zoo. So let's turn around and go directly across the way here. We're going to check out our awesome fossa. Now you guys may recognize this species from a pretty popular movie from a little while ago. Um, and one of the main themes of that movie is that we like to move it, move it. Yes, these animals are from Madagascar. Uh, really cool species. Again, not a cat, but they are more closely related to other mustelids like weasels. You guys can see she's got a really long body and a very, very long tail. They're excellent climbers and jumpers, and that tail helps them to balance when they're climbing and jumping around their natural environment. They're found in the forested areas on the island of Madagascar, which is lots of fun. Um, and they are Madagascar's top predator. So they're not very big. These guys weigh a max of about 25 pounds. Um, but you can see Kara there, she is all muscle. So check out as she climbs. She might go up and climb on that fire hose rope, which I hope she does because it's fun to watch. Um, she's munching on some snacks. Like I said, she's getting some red meat. 
Um, looks like she's also got a marrow bone in there today to hang out with and chew on. Um, she's one of our animals that is very engaging in enrichment. So we like to offer her a variety of different types of things. So she's coming down here, checking everything out, seeing where all those snacks might be. You can see her using her eyes. Uh, they've got a very good sense of eyesight as well as good senses of hearing and smell. That's what makes them one of the top predators in Madagascar. So she's munching on those yummy meat chunks. Looks like she found her bone. We'll see if she sticks around to eat it. But you can see kind of as she's munching away, she's got very sharp teeth. Um, and she uses those teeth not to chew her food, but to catch it and rip off pieces, and then she'll swallow those chunks whole. So marrow bones are a really good part of their diet also. She'll lick and chew out all the marrow in the middle of that bone, but it's actually really helpful for her teeth, to so make sure that her teeth stay nice and strong and clean. Um, so she'll use her tongue to lick off the pieces, and then she'll use her teeth to kind of chew off any little bits that she can, uh, and that'll help keep her teeth nice and clean and healthy. We do have quite a few questions. Of course. Uh, Olivia would like to know what her name is. Olivia, her name is Kara. She's Kara the Fossa. And then uh, Jamie would like to know if we are going to breed her and if she is endangered. So Fossas are not listed as endangered yet. Uh, they are threatened. Um, so. As to breeding her, she's not plan we're not planning on breeding her right now. Um, we don't have any males here at the San Antonio Zoo, so Kara's just living her best life with us here. But um, kind of a, a sad thing about fossas actually is that there's only about 10% of their native range left in Madagascar. So if you think about the state of Texas, um, the state of Texas is around the same size as the island of Madagascar. And if you take away 90% of that land, you're only left with the space of about Dallas, Austin, and Houston. Um, and that's all the space that uh, wild animals like fossas and lemurs have left in their native range. So it's not a whole lot of space left for these guys out in their natural environment. Good question. Kelly would like to know if they stay in packs or if they are solitary. They are more solitary than social, so you can find them overlapping ranges with each other, but typically they will kind of hang out on their own. Um, Kara is very content to hang out with her own toys, and uh, if there was another faucet in here, we would not be able to house them together necessarily because they typically live on their own and have their own range or territory that they stick to. Shan asked who the zookeepers are, but Shan, I'm not sure if you mean all of us or just the zookeepers for Kara the Fossa? <laughs> uh, so we have a whole team of zookeepers here that helps take care of Kara. Um, so right now we are working with her between myself and Tori here today, but throughout the day she might see two or three keepers and throughout her week she may see all of us at one time or another. So there's a whole team of us that work with Kara and we love her a lot. She's a, a big fan favorite between the keepers and the guests as well. Caitlin, can you tell us what do they eat and how long will she be here? <laughs> well, I hope she's here forever. I love Kara dearly. Um, so typically these guys are predators. They're going to be meat eaters. They're carnivores. So they eat things like small mammals, uh, but they're also known to be the primary predator of lemurs over in Madagascar. And a lemur is about um, only a little smaller than a fossa is, and they're very agile. So she has a ton of really amazing adaptations that allow her to be an amazing hunter um, and predator for those lemur species over there. Good questions. As we move on, Angela would like to know who your favorite grotto's animal is. Oh. So maybe you can answer that while we get to the <laughs> next one. That's a really hard question to answer, Angela. I love all of these animals a lot. Um, but I would have to say that my favorite grotto's cat is Dusky the fishing cat. I think he's just really fun and really silly. Um, but next up, we're going to go see a really neat little animal. So we're going to follow this way. Um, the next animal that we're going to see is not a cat either. She is more closely related to weasels and stoats. So really cool little, little critter. Um, her name is Bianca, and she is an American mink. So we'll see if she comes out here in just a second. There she is. 
Isn't she cute? Everyone really seems to enjoy her when they come visit her here at the zoo. Now, minks are found all over North America, and they've actually been introduced by humans to parts of Europe as well, where they actually are an endangered species over there. I'm sorry, invasive species. Um, but minks are very cool little guys. They're related to stoats, weasels, otters, that kind of thing. Um, looks like she's got another popsicle there. Hi, Bianca. As well as a box for some enrichment. So she's another very active animal. And it's kind of funny. She's like a little kid where she'll go and go and go and go and go and be very active. And then all of a sudden, she'll fall asleep. And she falls asleep in some really funny positions. So it's always fun to see guest reactions when she falls asleep in a weird, crazy position on exhibit. But right now, she's looking to get into that box. Um, again, they're amazing predators for being super, super teeny. This species is not all that big. That's as big as she'll ever get. And I couldn't tell you how much she weighs because, uh, like I said, we take care of a lot of animals. I don't remember exactly what her last weight was. Another really cool thing about these guys is that they are solitary, um, but their territories will overlap with members of the opposite gender. So male species or male ranges will overlap with female ranges. And sometimes they've even been known to share a nest or a burrow site for a night or two before they move on to another area of their range. Um, now, historically, minks were hunted for their pelts. They have a very soft fur. Um, unfortunately, nowadays, they're actually domesticated and farmed for their pelts as well. But their numbers in the wild are actually doing fairly well. They are listed as a species of least concern. So we're not worried about these animals becoming endangered at any point. Um, at least for now. Does anybody have any questions about Bianca? Stephen would like to know if she is easy to handle by hand. <laughs> Absolutely not, Stephen. So uh, we actually interact with Bianca through a protective barrier. So we don't go in with her on exhibit. Um, all of our handling with her is done through training or through some sort of protective barrier. So she's actually trained to come into a kennel and we can place that kennel on a scale to get her weights. Um, or to travel with her to any of her veterinary appointments that she'll have once a year or so um, to get her checkups and things like that. So good question, but no, she is not handleable, and I do not recommend this species as a pet um, because they are very unpredictable in terms of their behavior. Megan would like to know if she's playful. She seems to be very playful, so we offer enrichment items to her throughout the day, and she'll interact with almost all of it. So she, right now she's looking at that pool. She is a very good swimmer, and again, she's got that double layer coat, kind of like Dusky the fishing cat had, uh, that allows her to stay nice and warm in the water. So we'll offer her enrichment in her pool, and she'll interact with stuff in the water. We'll offer her boxes and things like that, where she'll have to interact with those to find food, all sorts of different things. How many offspring do they have, and how long will their babies stay with mom? Um, so minks are known to have up to eight offspring and one litter, um, and babies won't stay with mom all that long. So when they're born, they're very helpless. Their eyes are closed, um, and they depend on mom for her milk, just like kittens would. Um, but they'll only stay with mom for a few months. They're actually fairly quick with their development. They'll actually be able to go out on their own within six months or so of having been born. Good question. Can you tell us what's in that box? Uh, probably some of her food items. I'm not sure what Tori put in there for a surprise, but it might be some of her daily diet. It also may be um, some bugs. So we found that Bianca really seems to enjoy live crickets given to her as enrichment. So she might have some fun crickets in there or some mealworms or something of otherwise uh, deliciously tasty. Olivia would like to know, how old Bianca is and what is their normal lifespan? <laughs> uh, so I don't exactly remember Bianca's birthday, so I couldn't tell you how old she is, but she has been here at the zoo um, for most of her life, and I want to say that she's around three to four years old. Um, but again, I take care of a lot of animals, and it can be really hard to remember all of their birthdays. Are they in the same family with the mongoose? Yes, yes, they are. Um, that's another really good question. They're all part of the mustelid family, so they're related to mongoose, stoats, weasels, and otters. Good questions, guys. All right, so next up, we're going to move on to one of my favorite animals. 
Uh, we're actually going to backtrack just a little ways down this way because I think Tori put his food out um, in a really fun part of his exhibit that he likes to climb on. So we'll see if he feels like climbing today for us. Now this next cat, his name is uh, Ando, and he's a really cool, cool kitty. He's quite large compared to some of the other cats that we've seen, but here he comes. This is Ando, and he is our caracal. Caracals are found in Africa as well as parts of the Middle East and Eastern India. So they are one of the largest species in the, quote, small cat family. So he's not that small. He's actually um, around 40 pounds or so. But these guys are amazing predators. They don't have very many of their, pre their own predators in their natural environment, um, but they're known to hunt all sorts of different prey items. They've been known to eat things like uh, small mammals, otherwise uh, birds, as well as some small reptiles and snakes. Um, he's an excellent climber. As you can see, he'll climb all the way up and around. But they're also excellent jumpers. Really cool known fact about these guys is they've been seen jumping um, about 10 feet in the air to catch a bird while the bird was on wing. So they can catch a bird in flight, which I think is really, really cool. And right now it looks like Tori put out some of his meatballs on that platform there. And this kind of creates a fun challenge for Ando because that platform will move, so it helps him to exercise those balance muscles um, as well as provide him with some fun mental stimulation of how do I get to my food um, while on this moving platform, which is kind of fun. Again, Quilla guys. I would like to know why they have such large pointy ears. <laughs> That's a great question. So there are... Um, their name actually comes from the Turkish word that means black ears. Uh, and you can see that they do indeed have black ears with those funny little tufts on the ends. Um, now, those tufts aren't necessarily for any particular reason, but they do have excellent senses of hearing, which is one of the adaptations and tools that they use for hunting when they're out in their natural environment. Historically, caracals have also been kept by humans um, and used to help humans hunt. Um, I've been doing a little bit of research on to the history behind that, and I think it's really interesting that they, as well as cheetahs, have been known to help humans hunt over in their native areas of the world, which I just think is really a very interesting and cool thing. Um, that being said, they do not make good pets. I know he's really cute, but I would never want him in my house because he's a very large cat. And again, they're not necessarily like domesticated house cats. Um, they have a big cat attitude. There you go, buddy. Grab that yummy meatball. Today I would like to know if they vocalize and what it sounds like. He does vocalize. So they vocalize to communicate with members of their own species, as well as uh, Ando will communicate with us by using some of those vocals. He will hiss or sometimes even growl, um, and then he will also kind of make a funny little chuffing noise. Now, I don't know what all those noises mean because I don't speak caracal, but... It's really fun to know that he will communicate with his keepers on a day-to-day -day basis. So we go in and he'll either greet us with a little chuff or a hiss. Um, and those hisses may or may not be a good or a bad thing. We don't know what they mean, but that's one of those ways that they will communicate with members of their same species. Kelly asks if he likes going into the water. <laughs> you know, that's a fun question, Kelly. And we've offered him pools um, and tubs that we bring into his exhibit and fill him up with water, and I have never seen him get wet. Uh, I will tell you that when it rains, he's one of the first animals that wants to come inside. So I would say he does not enjoy the water. Um, out in their natural environment, they're not known to be very good swimmers, but also they're found in areas of the world where they don't have large bodies of water um, throughout most of the year. So they're not necessarily meant for swimming like the fishing cat is. Is it typical that their tails are the size of his, short like that? Yep, so that's not unusual for a caracal. Um, they do climb, but they're not excessive climbers. They don't spend a whole lot of time in trees, so that tail is not necessarily used for balance like you would see with Cara the fossa. Are caracals endangered? So they are threatened by uh, loss of habitat. A lot of these guys um, are losing a lot of their native space to agriculture, actually. Um, which is kind of unfortunate areas in their natural environment. But something that is helping them is ecotourism. So when people go to those areas of the world and they want to see the wildlife, caracals are one of the species that um, 
that they want to see. So hopefully ecotourism and responsible ecotourism will help them to regain some of their numbers and their population numbers out in the wild. Do you know how fast they can run? Oh, that's a really good question, and I will have to look that up, so I'm not sure. But I'll look that up, and I will get back to you once we are over with our chat, and I will find that comment and reply to it. So oftentimes when our guests come to the zoo, they'll see him napping throughout the day. Um, he has several favorite spots up on exhibit, and sometimes he's a little bit hidden from other people. So you can see him kind of hiding behind all that tall grass up there, or he has a very tall um, cave-like spot on one of his walls that he'll go and kind of snuggle down into for a good nap during the day. He's pretty cool to find, but again, he's a cat, so he naps a lot. Dolores asks if he's new because she does not remember seeing him before. Maybe we can point out uh, for future reference, anybody that comes to the zoo and walks through the grottoes, where they could find him. Absolutely. So let's walk down to his other window really fast. Um, he's not new. He is about eight years old. He just celebrated his eighth birthday a few weeks ago. Um, but he has lived here at the zoo for the majority of his life. So as we come down to this window, I mentioned that he likes hanging out uh, where all of those tall grasses are. But if you look up to the right, there's that big little divot up there in the rocks and he likes to hang out up there because it's pretty shady throughout the day. It's a nice shady spot for him to cool off in, um, especially in the summer when it gets hot out here. So I recommend to anybody that comes through any of our grottoes exhibits, if you don't miss, so you don't see an animal right away, uh, hang out for a few minutes. See if they're sleeping somewhere. They may not be moving or they may not be as easy to see. So good questions, guys. Jamie would like to know if he is in a breeding program. Again, not right now. Um, doesn't mean that he couldn't be in the future, but at the moment, no, he is not being used in a breeding program. Again, guys, if you have any of those other questions, feel free to tip-tap those into the comments section. Um, to expand on that question real quick, Jamie, so he's not being used for a breeding program right now, but he is part of what we call an SSP, or a Species Survival Plan. So a variety of zoo species um, throughout the country and throughout the world are a member of these SSPs, and they are basically a program where you maintain a record of all of the genetics of these individual animals throughout facilities in the country. Um, and as long as you have those genetics on record, you can actually look at those individuals and see who would be valuable as breeding partners with other animals under human care. Um, so like I said, right now he's not part of a breeding program, but that does not mean in the future that he would not be paired with a female um, from another facility. So those are good questions. Can you tell us again where caracals are found and what they eat? Great questions. Caracals are found in Africa as well as parts of the Middle East and Eastern India. Um, they are predators and they can eat things like small mammals, sometimes small reptiles, but they've also been known to be excellent hunters of birds. They can jump about 10 feet in the air and catch a bird while they're flying around, which I think is really cool. So they're amazing predators. They've got these big, massive paws for jumping and catching those birds. Um, also, they have those retractable claws that a lot of cats will have, and those really help him when he is hunting for a lot of those prey items. It looks like he's going to hang out on the other side of that exhibit. So we're going to head on and meet our last animal that lives here in the grottos, um, and she tends to be a crowd favorite. She's lots of fun. One last question about mm -hmm. Mondo before we... <laughs> move on. Angela would like to know if we plan on getting him a friend. <laughs> like I said earlier for Jamie, Angela, um, so he's part of an SSP, so a species survival plan. He could potentially be paired up with a female in the future, but as of right now, he is not um, in the works for any breeding programs. So good question. They are solitary animals, so uh, in terms of getting him a friend just to hang out with, um, Nope, he much prefers to be on his own. He does interact with uh, his keepers throughout the day, 
He's going to check and see what's going on inside. So let's go hang out and see our last grotto's critter. Now, this last grotto's animal is an, uh, an actual cat, so makes sense in the cat grottos. Just naturally, these guys are found in Indonesia, um, and they're called clouded leopards. Now, I almost expect to hear all of you guys through the phone going, aww, because she's very, very cute. We're going to come out this way, and <laughs> here she is on this side. Um, so everybody, one, two, three, aww. She's a very cute girl. Her name is Indira, and she is nine years old. Um, so she has been living here at the San, Indo San Antonio Zoo for most of those nine years. She recently celebrated a birthday, and it looks like she's got some fun enrichment as well. She's got that marrow bone to help with her, her teeth and her dental health. Um, but if you look at the ground, I don't know if you guys can see it in the camera yet, but she has a mirrored boomer ball, which is lots of fun for some of these guys to interact with because um, they'll bat balls around and play with them, but having that mirrored surface also helps to stimulate that visual sense and it kind of keeps things extra fun. Kelly would like to know if there is a meaning to her name. If there is a meaning to her name. I don't believe so. She came to the San Antonio Zoo with the name Indira, so I couldn't tell you. But to me, she's beautiful. I think it means she's beautiful. Now, clouded leopards are known to have these beautiful coats. You guys can see her gorgeous spots. Um, and if, if she ever looks back towards this way, you can see that they've got really adorable, like heart-shaped noses, which is one of my favorite facts about them. Um, they just have a really cute pink heart-shaped nose. And really kind of a weird fact about these cats is they actually have um, neck bones that do not allow to make normal cat vocalizations. She cannot purr, and unlike large cats, she cannot roar like a lion or a tiger. Um, so she makes all sorts of different noises, but she makes uh, little meows and chirps and chuffs, but she can't purr and she can't be really loud because of the, ne the way her neck bones are in her neck, which is kind of a neat thing. Um, I stand corrected. Her name does mean beautiful. I knew I'd heard that somewhere. <laughs> uh, another really cool fact about these cats is that they have weird ankles. Um, so their ankles on their rear feet can be completely rotated around. They can climb straight up a tree and they can climb down a tree head first uh, without any problem at all, which I think is super crazy. Um, they can hang upside down. I've seen her hang upside down from some of these horizontal. Hey guys, sorry about that. Uh, apparently in our grottos area, sometimes our service is a little wonky. So we came back out here, we're reconnected. Try to head back into that same window and check out Indira one more time before we head out. So come on back in. All right, here's Indira. Uh, we did have another question about um, does Indira have a friend? And like most of the animals here in the grottos, clouded leopards are solitary animals. So actually getting her a friend or getting another clouded leopard that lives on exhibit with her could potentially be very stressful. Um, so to offer that world... And we're back! Sorry about that guys. So we'll stand here and you might be able to see Indira way back there in the background. Um, but for now, does anybody have any other questions about clouded leopards? So I know it's kind of hard to see her in there when we're going in and out of service. But uh, another one of my favorite facts about these guys is that they are so amazing and they're just lots of fun to interact with. She does interact with her keepers on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, and she was hand-reared before she came to the San Antonio Zoo. So she, uh, again, may potentially be part of the SSP or Species Survival Plan. Um, potentially will have a mate in the future, but for now she lives here at the San Antonio Zoo and like I was saying, clouded leopards are typically solitary unless it is breeding with other clouded leopards. Do you know how much Indira weighs? Uh, Indira weighs 35 pounds. She's a big girl and it's all muscle. Um, you guys can see her when you guys come back to visit here at the zoo. Once we reopen, you'll notice her. She's an excellent climber. She'll climb and walk around all of those walkways um, that are elevated above the, the surface of her exhibit. So you have to look up if you're going to come and visit her here in the grottos. <laughs> I 
All right, guys, so our service is very spotty, so we'll answer some last couple of questions before we wrap it up. Um, one of the questions is, how old is Indira? She just had a birthday, and she is nine years old. Um, and then we have another question of, what is a chuff? So a chuff is a type of vocalization that you'll hear from some different types of large cats. Um, and it sounds almost like a coughing sound. It's kind of funny, and I won't try to do it here for you on video because I can't imitate it. No, I'm not going to try it. It's really hard for me to do animal uh, imitations. But it's almost like a coughing sound. Can you chuff, Tori? Yes. Come chuff for us, Tori. Oh All right. Gosh. It's not the greatest. Try it. Try it for the, okay. the social distancing. Can you guys hear it? Do it again. <laughs> <laughs> All right. <laughs>